Hello, this is Technically Scientific. My name is Max. And I'm Luke. And uh, what, do you, what do you have for us today, Luke? Well, uh, today we have the Osborne One. Uh, this is the first portable computer ever produced, um, produced by the Osborne Corporation, uh, which was founded specifically to produce this computer and uh, bankrupted by this computer. Yes. So <laughs> this was this was actually this was the this was the first ever portable computer. So it's not like oh this came around at the, around the same time. This was the really the first one. And uh, as you can see, it's pretty big. Uh, so. How portable was this, really? There's a few reasons that this wouldn't really be considered portable today. Uh, firstly, it weighs ten and a half, ten and a half, uh, over ten and a half kilograms, so it weighs a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And secondly, as you can see right here, um, it does not have a battery. This is where you plug in the battery. So this doesn't have a battery inside of it. You actually have to buy a separate battery, carry that around with you, as well as this ten kilogram thing. And it would not last very long on that battery, mind you, because back then. They didn't have lithium-ion polymers, they had lead-acid batteries, which, um, don't. You, which are heavy and don't hold as much uh, energy. So what are, what, are some of the, what are some of the specs of this computer? So what, I get this computer, I pay, what was it, $2,000? $2,000 uh, was $1,750. Okay, so and that's 1980 money. So that's, that's like $5,000 today. Yeah, that's, that's a crazy amount. Like you, you have to really try to spend that much money on a computer today. That's how much I paid for my dual 980 Ti fully decked out uh, gaming rig. Yeah, which is, you know, and that's like the highest you can go, really. Yeah, I mean, there's really uh, there's no up from there, unless you want to put four 980 Ti's. But there's or no there. Titans or something in yeah, there. But that th you... at that point, you're just throwing money in the garbage. Exactly, uh, which really you were with this, too. I mean, um, Well, see, this the difference is this, um, had, this had, a, had a niche. Uh, it's kind of like those people who buy those GT Dominators. They just want as much powerful, as much power as a desktop. And they want to bring it with them. Now this wasn't as much power as, a, as every desktop. It was a, a Z84 megahertz CPU with 64 kilobytes of RAM. So it was pretty moderately spec for the time, but it wasn't amazing. Um, but it was, in fact, the only option you had if you wanted to carry something with you, and you didn't want to carry two things, being a monitor and a computer. Um, and usually also a keyboard. Um, some computers had keyboards attached, like the uh, some of the IBM clones, but not all of them did. Now the screen itself is only 3.5 inches. It's a tiny, tiny screen. Very small. It's in, but one of the kind of appeals of this was that you could just bring it with you. It was like it was all in one. It's yeah. almost like the uh, the, the HP, iMac. yeah, like the iMac or like the HP, almost like you know gigantic tablet, yeah. all in ones that they have now where it's just, it's all, everything's in one box. And that was really where the appeal of this was, not in the fact that you could really carry a computer around with you anywhere, but I mean, more in that if you did need to move it, everything was in one spot. And uh, a funny thing about this screen, uh, not unlike a lot of screens at the time that were this small, this screen is actually thicker than it is wide. Really? Yes. Uh, as you'll see in the teardown, the length of the cathode ray tube is greater than the, the screen's width. Which is crazy. Yeah. You know, it's, that's unheard of today, especially. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of show a quick comparison before we get a little bit more into what makes this computer tick, uh, this is a Lenovo YogaPad 3, yeah. which was the thinnest laptop in 2015. Uh, laptops have since gotten early thinner. Early 2015. Then the uh, MacBook came they've, out. Yeah, they've since gotten even thinner, which is crazy because this is really thin. But it's just, it's, it's insane because this weighs what? Maybe less than... This weighs exactly three pounds. So that's tiny. And like I said, laptops have gotten even smaller uh, since then. But it's, it's just crazy how in 36 years, this came out in 1980, it's 2016 right now. Uh, in 36 years, computers have gotten so much smaller and so much more portable. I can carry that around my backpack. This is my backpack, you know? Uh, just... For a comparison, this is the keyboard to the uh, Osborne One, and I'm holding that with one hand, and I'm going to hold this entire laptop with everything in it in the other hand, and this weighs less. Now, mind you, this is passively cooled. There's no no. This is this is actively cooled. This is actively cooled. Yes, okay, so I was I was I was aware of that. I thought that that was a no. It's it's not the MacBook. It does not thermal throttle. Well, it still does, but not as badly. Um, fun fact about Core Core M. Um, if you buy a Core M laptop, don't expect to actually do anything with it. Not you want to put this keyboard back in? Um, um, all right, so 
I'm going to ask you a little bit about the kind of the ports and what you're really getting when you buy this computer because a lot of people who are buying this computer who weren't buying it for the portability may have been buying it for what came inside of it. So what exactly is inside of this machine? So as far as what's in this machine, um, you have a solid plastic chassis that holds up this five and a quarter inch drive, this five and a quarter inch drive, and this screen, uh, which holds them and suspends them above a, uh, a one PCB motherboard uh, with uh, 64 kilobytes of RAM and a four megahertz Z80 CPU with um, a fairly decent set of connectivity for the time. Uh, you had a modem port, serial RS232, which I still actually work, use at work on a regular basis. Um, IEEE 488, which you could plug in, uh, I think that was for extended memory? I, don't quote me on that. I forget what that, one, what that port's for. Uh, you had a video out port reset and you had a pl place to plug in your battery. Um, so you really you had a lot of stuff going for this computer, as well as the fact that going with the whole portability all in one thing, you even had shelves to store your five and a quarter inch drives in, or drives, sorry, to store your five and a quarter inch discs in, um, so that you could just put all of your discs in here and then carry this with you, and that is your whole computing experience. It's as if you had uh, a place for your thumb drive in, your, in a modern mm -hmm. computer. That's, that's the equivalent of that. Now I could almost see myself buying this and then sticking a monitor and throwing a video out and just having everything kind of all in one here and just ignoring the tiny screen and having you know two floppy drives, a nice place to put my floppy disks, all these I.O., a nice keyboard. Well, you know, like I could I could see myself doing that instead of buying this for kind of the gimmicky portability of it. Well, the downside to doing that is they, they had better options for that at the time, uh, especially with better keyboards. This keyboard is a nice buckling spring keyboard. However, the layout is kind of non-traditional. You have these weird arrow keys over here, and you could get a Model M and get an IBM PC, which would have been a little bit faster, um, with uh, a real nice Motorola CPU in there, um, as opposed to this thing. Now this thing, if you wanted to use it as a desktop all-in-one, it does take up actually about as much space as a normal desktop computer did, maybe a little bit more lengthwise. Um, but the screen, surprisingly, is not that hard to use because back then they weren't that high resolution. So the, the, the letters are about as small as a you would find on a phone screen. It's it's it's. I have no I have no problem. Yeah, I have no problem seeing this uh, seeing the screen. It's just the fact that it is just, so just tiny. Just for comparison, let's let's look at uh, Reddit on my phone screen. Let's just open that up. So as you can see, the letters on here are actually a only a little bit bigger than the letters on here. So it's really not mm -hmm. that impossible to read this is this screen. Which I guess is kind of like the saving grace of this is that. Even though the screen is so small because the resolution was so small as well, you kind of it didn't really matter too yeah. much. Um, so one more thing I want to mention before we get into the teardown of this, where we're actually going to try to fix it. This is a broken machine that we got off of eBay. Yeah. So we're going to try to go in and uh, and fix it up. But it also came with this Osborne One user reference guide. Now what's really cool about this is that I believe it was three months after the computer came out, they essentially contacted the eight people who bought it, <laughs> and uh, they had them, you know, kind of write the user manual. So the user manual is actually really easy to read, and it's got a lot of information on some of the common programs that people would run on it, and, uh, you know, it's kind of less of a technician's guide and more of a user's guide, which was uh, really cool and also a bit odd for that time because a lot of people who were using these computers were also computer technicians, uh, or just hobbyists and engineers and people who really knew how to use this stuff already. Yeah. So it's kind of cool that they came out with a guide that was made by users for users rather than uh, releasing a technical guide that the everyday person may not have been able to understand. So just to, to sum up what Max is trying to say with, in their own words, uh, this is the, for, the uh, introduction to this manual. This manual is like few others in the microcomputer world. This manual was written by users of the Osborne One, not technicians. This manual was written several months after the Osborne, uh, sorry, several months after the computer appeared and is based on reactions to the observations of the previous manual. This manual emphasizes teaching of how to make the computer perform tasks and does not stress rote memorization of material. This manual was written in part by people using the equipment and software it describes. And a lot of you may think, wow, that's a really big manual to come with a computer, but 
back then, um, if you don't recall, computers came with big manuals uh, because you don't have a GUI um, to show you what you're doing. You literally have to do everything with the command manually. Line. Yeah. Well, and the, and the reason that that may be a problem uh, without a good manual is with a GUI, you can see all the buttons that are available to you. You can say, all right, I press the Windows button, and then those are all the different functions this computer does. It tells you what it does. With this, you get a blinking cursor, and you got to know what you got to type in. And this just helps you with all that, as well as telling you what the limitations of the computer were, which is <clears throat> very helpful because really, you know, you in modern times, you don't really run into the limits of your computer's co computing and RAM capabilities. But back then, that was a regular consideration for what you did and didn't do on your computer. Um, only 64 kilobytes of RAM on this. I mean, that's that's your average web page, less than uh, modern times. Which you could load on your modem. Yeah. Well, you could only bare, barely load. They didn't have the World Wide Web back then. They just that's had... That's true. You, you could you you communicate could... with other yeah. computers. Uh, okay, so is there anything else you'd like to mention about this really quick before we uh, get into the teardown? I'd just like to mention um, two, two things. Thing one is the incredible construction quality of this computer. I mean, it's really, really well built. Um, it feels nice to use, and it's this is a solid metal keyboard deck like you'd find in a, a luxury keyboard nowadays. And the uh, this thir or, um, 10 kilogram computer has actually been dropped, and it is barely noticeable. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I'd like to mention is this computer, I feel like, had an interesting idea, but it and you hear this a lot when you look at the first of anything, it was so far ahead of its time that it, it, it didn't even touch what we would consider a portable computer. I mean, looking at it nowadays, it looks ridiculous because they tried to do something that was really impossible at the time, and they got as close as anyone could have, and it's, it's really impressive what they did, but it's really not something anyone really wants to use, which is why that uh, company went, went under so quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, why don't we get into the teardown? All right. So um, we're going to take apart this keyboard just to see what might be wrong with it, see if there is anything wrong with it. I already took the screws out um, using my trusty multi-head screwdriver here. Um, I, don't I, I hope that there's something wrong with the keyboard because if there's something wrong with the keyboard, it'd be really easy to fix because, as you know, keyboards are pretty basic electronically. Um, but... Uh, really, since they're basic electronically, there's usually not anything wrong with them. Uh, so I'm going to open this up, take that off. Uh, as you can see, inside of this uh, plastic container for the keyboard, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of empty, wasted space. Um, and that's, that's kind of a theme throughout the Osborne One. It's uh, not as dense as it could be with all the electronics inside of it, because it is, it's kind of constructed out of off-the-shelf-ish components. I mean, a lot of them are custom-made, a lot of them aren't. Um, and that, that's kind of the, one of the problems with the Osborne one is that it could have been physically smaller uh, and still done all the same stuff. And they didn't really think that heavily about making it super portable. And that's part of the reason it failed. Um, looking at these buttons here, the, they all look to be functional. And presently, I'm paying the most attention to the Enter key because it's the one that would need to work for the whole thing to work. And there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with any of these buttons uh, looking at it. It looks like they are all functioning and the little PCB on the keyboard that translates all the buttons to the computer itself uh, looks to be fine. All the ribbon cables in that look to be working pretty well. Um, and as you can see, all the buttons are functioning as they should. So I don't really, I don't know. Um, I'm going to put this back together and then I'm going to uh, open up the actual computer itself and see what's up going on in there. Um, really I don't think that the problem lies within this keyboard. Which is a disappointment, really. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's move to that. All right, so I'm gonna take that uh, that same screwdriver and unscrew the faceplate here, which actually um, <clears throat> leads to the whole inside of the computer. The outside of the computer doesn't really have many screws or uh, really anything that leads you to think that it's a computer, other than that you know it's a computer from the logo. Um, which is one of the interesting things about the design philosophy of Osborne. Um, it, was, it looked very, I mean, especially at the time, very futuristic in that it was just all very smooth. Kind of like a, a you, you would picture an Apple product. If you look at an iPhone, you don't really see any screws. Um, a lot of Apple's philosophy, and a lot of the design philosophy people like that, is that hiding the way something was made is a, is a 
sign of quality. I don't know how much I agree with that, but it is something that Osborne did. And it does not really hinder the uh, accessibility of it that much because at the time they didn't really have much else to build a computer out of and Phillips head screws and computer parts. So I can still get into the whole thing with just a Phillips head screwdriver, which is nice. Now one thing I thought was interesting uh, about the Osborne one is when I turned it on for the first time, I noticed that the screen was white. And um, as you know, a lot of the phos phosphor screens at the time weren't white. Uh, that's a different length again. That's so weird. These are all different length screws. Um, a lot of screens at the time ran off of was it phosphorus or sulfur. I can't remember. I think it's it phosphorus. Was, yeah, it was, it was, they ran off of phosphorus. And they, because of that, were very green. Um, I have an Apple IIc monitor, and that is entirely green. Um, so I, I don't know what technology they used to make this one white, um, bright white, in fact, uh, with zero hints of green whatsoever. I don't even know if it's color. It might even be color. I don't think it is. No, it's not color. I take that back. I know it's not color. Um, there was definitely no ability to make color monitor at that point in time. And this is the final screw, so after this, the faceplate will just pop right off. So once we have the faceplate off, we can, oop, no, found it. Woo. All right, so this now pops right off. You gotta be careful, we gotta close the keyboard. Thank you, Max. Cameraman to the rescue. Oh boy. I'm very hard not to. I don't know what is internally holding this uh, on. Knobs. Uh, knobs. I don't want to pull those knobs off. Do they come out? Do they come out? Max asking the vital questions. Uh, let's keep going slowly. Uh, yeah, it looks like these are pretty. Yeah, those knobs are really on. Hefty there. on. So, don't pull on it, Max. That's the problem. Hmm. Hmm. Uh. Hmm. Well, Max. With the knobs on there like that, I'm not yeah, 100% sure. Those knobs are really on there. I don't want to break this. I don't think Max Neither does do either. I. So, what I'm going to do... Yeah, it's definitely, and it is definitely the knobs keeping it on. Yeah. The knobs are, in fact, in the way of pulling this off. Who makes knobs that don't just pop off? I have no idea how they built this if, if the knobs don't pop doing, off. Doing maintenance on this thing in the 1980s would have been terrible. Hmm. We'll be right back. We're going to look up how to take the knobs off of this. We'll be right back. All right, so we can't take the knobs off of the faceplate. So instead what we're going to try to do is we're actually going to try to slide the whole uh, frame of the computer out. Because we noticed that there are a few screws back here. And we didn't lose our screwdriver yet. Oh, good, that didn't fall. So, we're going to see if we can do that. Um, while we're back here, I just wanted to talk about some of the interesting pieces of this. Uh, one of the ways that the Apple IIc was able to be so light is that it had an external PSU. As you can see, this has an integrated PSU, and it even... No, I'm sorry for the cord there. Uh, it even has... Uh, just a straight line into it. It does not have a replaceable cable. So if we break this cable, we have broken the computer. Um, I just wanted to remind Max of that as he unscrews near it. <laughs> I brought my wire cutters. Yes, Max. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, um, interesting things about this. This handle is actually reinforced with a piece of metal um, because leather could definitely not hold this computer up. And the leather, um, pleather actually, because it was the 80s, um, is, is all cracked and, oop, falling apart. Yeah, the um, this thing definitely wasn't built to last for was it 2016. Yeah, 36 yeah. years. So I don't uh, think anything's built to last for 36 years, Max. Especially mm -hmm. not your relationship. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, that hurt. I was gonna say, you know, like people under the age of 36. All right. So let's try sliding the whole thing out. Well, why don't you let me get out the last screw first? All, All right. right, there we go. So now, hold yeah, hold it steady. All right, so, so that is not 
here. I think we're going to need to lift it up a little bit so that we can hear you lift up. Wow, there is, it, it's really interesting. I can't wait to show you guys this once we figure out how to get this open, but the inside of this computer is basically empty. It's, it's just one main PCB and then a big hollow chamber. Um, May I see the flashlight? Oh, huh. What? And I found out why our floppy drive isn't working. Why? Well, you see, there's a, there's a uh, little internal connector inside of the floppy drive which is not connected. Um, oh! We will not be able to reach that without getting this computer open, however, so we won't be able to fix it. May I it see happens. the, uh... There you go, Max. Okay. Alright, let's see. Ah, haha. Uh -huh. What? I found out what's holding these on. Is it's it the a little metal so, thing? <laughs> yeah, there's a little little, uh, little Allen key. I'm gonna go get a tiny little Allen key to, to get those off. So I went and grabbed my jeweler's tools, um... Because these are really small pieces. And jeweler's tools... I highly recommend if you like taking apart computers to get a set of them because they are still too big. Darn. They are the, uh, the smallest tools you can get, really. And they're still not small enough for this. Let's try, let's, let's try a T5. You know what? That's the, maybe they had, they had torques back then. They didn't, but I'm putting a T5 in the, in the Allen wrench slot and I'm not going to explain it to you. Go in a hole. Oh! Oh! Hey! Look at that! And there we go. Let's make sure we don't lose it. Woohoo! Alright, so we got the faceplate off. Well. Well, w almost. <laughs> we're in the progress, uh, progress, we're in the process of doing it. Um, side note, when you are taking apart a uh, computer with teeny little pieces, I highly recommend doing so on a clean desk with magnets. Yes, magnetized bowls are a computer technician's best friend and if you don't and if you uh want to get creative like i do i have actually purchased um little oopsie uh, a set of buckyballs and i make my own little magnetic plates out of stuff with them it's great uh plus you can play with the buckyballs that are left over so we kind of we kind of bent that rheostat a little bit um so yeah. let me just bend that back into place like that there we go now those rheostats are where they're supposed to be um so as you can see the inside of this computer is pretty uh, empty, um, which is weird. Here, I'm actually going to uh, shine a flashlight into there. Oh, you know, I have a flash over here, Max. Oh, yes, you do. So, um, so here's, here's the inside of the computer, guys. Uh, as you can see, here are the two Rio stats. Uh, one of them is brightness. One of them, I think, is contrast. Yeah, contrast. Little, little jerks. Um, and as you can see back here, um, there is... Uh, where is the processor? I cannot see it. Um... To be honest, I wouldn't be able to tell. I haven't worked on anything this old ever. Uh, well, not in a while. I mean, uh, here's a here's a thing that's supposed to be down. So let's just plug that in. I uh, don't know why it wasn't plugged in, but it is now. Um, there, I think, is the uh, the little speaker. Um, there's just a bunch of little uh, little RAM chips in here. Tons <laughs> of them. Uh, probably adds up to a whole bunch of RAM. Even by today's standards, about you. Um, <laughs> Over here, if you come over here, um, right here, you can see what I was talking about. Right there, that uh, that blue wire is not plugged in. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try and plug that in. Okay, I, I can touch the blue connector, but I can't actually. All see right. It. So as opposed to breaking it, which we're getting close to doing, let's take the whole five and a quarter inch floppy bay out. So while Max is gone, I stole the camera, and I am going to be uh, just telling you about this the internal of this. So interesting stuff uh, just that I saw. This uh, CRT is kind of just held in place with a big metal clamp. That's kind of neat. Um, interesting internal design. This giant uh, plastic thing holds up the floppy drives and the, the screen. And the computer is actually a pretty thin little thing. Um, the PSU back there. Um, well, you can't see it. Let me add some light. There's a PSU back there. Uh, it's really not that uh, that big. So not that much power going into this computer. That's all. That's all. All right, so, so Max and I flipped the computer over. So we get the uh, PCB screws here, here, and here. Um, as you can see, pretty uniform looking motherboard, actually. Uh, very different than motherboards nowadays. Where you, you can very definitely take, uh, like, notice different pieces. Here it's just all one looking piece. One, uh, one piece. 
or one similarly looking piece. Go. Now, you got to keep special care of this PCB because it is older than Max and I put together. Yes. By a year, actually. By one year. And it always will be. Because hmm. that's how math works. No, it won't. No, it won't. That's, it never will be. It's not how math now. works. Next year, it won't be. Because Max and I together age twice as fast as it does. So. Alright. So that PCB is going to go there. And Max is going to hold that with his other hand while he holds the camera. Mm -hmm. So if these shots suck, um, we're sorry. That right there, as you can see, is the Skylake I-7 that I was talking about earlier. Yes. Also, because we're uh, the smartest people on the planet, we did not actually discharge ourselves before this. Max, that's a myth. Electricity is a myth. <laughs> this runs on magic. In myths. <laughs> There's actually a centaur in the middle of this that uh, powers it. Yeah. Runs on a little little hamster wheel. Inside the uh, um, second found quarter-inch bay. Ooh, that is really in there. This is not as nicely soldered as this is. <laughs> not even close. Uh, this actually looks hand-soldered. Oh my. Look at this. This uh, this PSU here is, is basically hand-soldered. Here, here's the PSU. Max, uh, we don't actually have a solder of the PSU, so why don't you... That is... Is that the PSU? Yeah, this is the PSU. Oh wow, yeah, because no, because this That's is riding... That's the PSU, bro. Is it? Okay. I guarantee it. All right, let's get a better. This is what a PSU looks like, y'all. From the 1980s. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is gonna slide out like this, and then I can plug that right in. Boom, plugged in. All right, so <laughs> it's a lot of work for one little. One that, little thing. that is now plugged in. Uh, let's let's get a shot of the inside of this five and a quarter inch bay. Uh, let's just make sure this belt works. These belts uh, over time turn into basically mush. So I'm gonna just check that while it's. It's open, because uh, if it isn't working, we have to replace the belt, too. Uh, it, it does seem to be working. All of this stuff seems to be working pretty well. We are not going to put this all the way back together until we have it, uh, we, we know that it's working, basically. So um, why don't we at least put the PCB board back in? Yeah, we're, well, we're going to put the internal parts back together. We're not going to put the case back on. All right, so we got the floppy drive out, um, just to look at it, see what's wrong with it, because it's not spinning up at all. Um, so looking at it here, uh, we checked all the internal components. Everything seems to be working, um, but we thought we'd take the opportunity to just explain kind of how uh, the internals of a five and a quarter inch floppy drive works. So you take the uh, your disc, right, and you stick it in there like that. It slides in, and then uh, you push the lever arm, which pushes the um, little sp uh, motor spinner on the, the disc itself, and then the uh, reed head, which is actually on the other side, uh, makes contact with the disc, and this uh, felt head, it's actually a felt tip on this, pushes the magnetic disc into it to make sure that the disc makes contact with the reed head. Um, and somewhere in that mix of stuff, something's not working. Uh, we don't know where it is, but it's certainly something. Um, we're thinking the motor that spins is broken. Um, the motor that spins. The motor that spins the disc is broken. Um, and we have no manner by which to fix that. So we might not have a working uh, Osborne 1 by the end of this, which is kind of disappointing. Um, if you guys have any suggestions on what might be wrong, uh, you can send them to us. However, we are giving to this to someone pretty soon, um, broken or working. Um, so, yeah, that's that. All right, so we're back. We have the computer back together. Um, we're gonna see if it boots. We don't think it will. We couldn't get the motor to spin up at all. Um, so we don't, we don't think we're gonna be able to get anything out of this. But just to put it to rest, let's try loading the operating system, which is CPM. All right, that's in. I don't hear any spinning. Still don't hear any spinning. So it does not work. <laughs> well, you know, we tried. Yeah, we, we sadly don't have the correct parts to replace uh, what is broken in here, which is 
appears to be that the motor is broken or just the entire floppy drive in general is broken. These old, especially this um, particular model, uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drives, very unreliable. Uh, they broke all the time, uh, even, even back then. Um, let alone up till today. The nice thing about this though is that the person who we are giving this to probably has some spare five and a quarter inch floppy drives lying around and because floppy drives are standardized or they were standardized because they don't really make them anymore uh, it's really easy to stick a new one in there. Yeah. Uh, this doesn't run on the floppy uh, uh, ribbon cable, it runs off of a different cable I haven't seen that cable before. Uh, you, you, it's just, you saw it in the teardown. I forget what that's called, um, but it, it is a cable that was common back then. You couldn't plug in your three and a quarter inch into here, um, partly because this motherboard wouldn't have any idea what to do with it, but also because that cable is not the same type. Um, so yeah. All right, so that was uh, the Osborne one, the first ever portable computer. If you liked this video uh, and you wanna see more of our content, I encourage you to subscribe. And if you like the video and you'd like to leave us a you know a question or a comment, you can do so in the comment section below. Yeah. All right. Thanks for watching.